Frank, we got Charlie in the line. What do you want to ask him? I am the underwriter on our team and I'm looking at deals. How critical does your analysis need to be before going into a LOI? What I like to do first though, is I don't just underwrite deals for hours automatically. There's a lot of deals. And, and again, I've done this probably hundreds of times. So I'm not saying you're going to get there just because I tell you this, but you probably want to create a couple different phases of underwriting, right? Like there's some quick ways to do it just without going into so much depth that you're spinning your wheels. What I did when I first started underwriting is because I didn't have this massive deal flow. So I got on brokers list on markets I didn't really care about, not like it was a bad market, but I just wanted more practice. I'm Brian Briscoe, host of the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast, and this podcast is different than everything else out there. I bring together a new and an experienced investor on each episode, and I let the aspiring investor ask the questions that they need answered. So if you're an aspiring investor yourself, you probably will have the exact same questions. Now, before we get to this episode, make sure you hit the subscribe button below and that little bell to make sure you get notified every time we post a new episode. And now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast. I'm your host, Brian Briscoe. Got a very great show lined up for you today. Two amazing guests. We got Charlie Hardage and Frank Tashima. So guys, welcome to the show today. Hey, thanks, thanks for Brian. having me. Awesome. Well, as is tradition, our experienced investor is going to be up first. So Charlie, how's it going, man? It's going really well. Can't complain. Living in awesome. paradise. Living in paradise, huh? I didn't know paradise was in Tennessee. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, Frank's in uh, Hawaii, so I'm not in paradise, but maybe I feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Char for, for listeners, Charlie's Tennessee, Frank's in Maui, and I think all three of us wish we were in Maui today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there we go. And Frank's like, man, island fever is just killing me. But uh, <laughs> right. So Charlie, do us a favor. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I, I do live in Nashville. I'm not in uh, in Hawaii, but uh, live in Nashville. Grew up in Dallas and man, I, I think I'm the epitome of the rich dad, poor dad scenario. I was taught the middle-class mindset, get a good education so you can go to a great college to get a good degree, to get a good job and, and work your way up that uh, that corporate ladder. I had a really good buddy when I was like 10 or 11, uh, his dad was always home mm -hmm. and cause he had his own business. And so it was really nice to kind of get that different perspective. I just didn't know that you could do that. You know, I didn't know, um, that rich dad was a thing, right? And, until I read the book, uh, probably 20 years later. But um, yeah. well, here, yeah. here's something interesting. I've never talked to anybody who read that book and identified themselves with having a rich dad. You know, yeah, everybody I've talked to is like, yeah, I was totally poor dad. I was totally poor dad. But anyway, I think that's why that book is so influential to people. Yeah, yeah, totally. And uh, when I was 17, 9-11 happened, you know, I was too young at the time to, to go in. My parents weren't going to sign me up. I don't blame them, but you know, they weren't going to sign me up. And, and uh, so went to school, went to college uh, in college. I was like, man, I still want to go into the military, but I was almost mm -hmm. done. So I, I got it after I graduated, got a job uh, selling computers at a fortune 50 company mm -hmm. did really well, but I still had that kind of burning, you know, feeling, uh, eating feeling. And, and so I, yeah. I was 25, joined the army. When I got out of the army, I went back to IT sales, but uh, mm -hmm. on my second deployment, that's where I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And that just lit a fire. And man, I'm, I'm so passionate about real estate. I, I love it. I could talk about it for hours. Yeah. Yeah. I, I read it. I was still active duty. I mean, the first time I read it, I was active duty and I was on a, a slow boat between Okinawa, Japan and the Philippines for an exercise. <laughs> so that's when the light went on for me. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So how, how did everything progress from there? I mean, you get out of the army, go back to IT sales, you know, eventually you're jumping into real estate. Talk to us about that. Yeah. Well, actually I wanted to, to make the army a career. I mean, when I, like I said, when I went in, I was 25 and for me, it wasn't a three or five year, you know, ordeal. I, uh, I went enlisted to start, but I, I was going to go to officer candidate school or, or green to gold, I guess, for the army. And I, I got injured on my second deployment. And so I got medically retired. And so I, I went from, okay, I, I left IT sales to pursue my passion of, yeah. of being in the military to, I can't do it anymore. So I went back to IT sales, not because I loved it, but that was the only thing I knew. Yeah. Um, you know, interested in real estate at the time, knew nothing about it, learned as much as I could. 
-hmm. but it was that shiny object syndrome of, I can do this, I can do that, I can do that. But I wasn't focused on anything. I was focused Mm -hmm. on everything. Yeah. And man, it really, I think after talking to some people that were in syndication, I really had this kind of clarity and and this feeling of multifamily syndication was perfectly meant for me because I I knew that the W-2 route wasn't my path. I knew that for sure. IRAs, 401ks, while I have those or or had them, that's not what I wanted to do. I don't want to work until a 60 or 70. I wanted really not not only the financial freedom, but the time freedom. I wanted to be able to do what I want, what I wanted, when I wanted to do it. And W-2 doesn't do that, right? Um, Military definitely doesn't do that. And Brian, you know way better than I do because you were in for a lot longer, but yeah. yeah. um, yeah. So, you know, I I think uh, when I heard about the syndication space and I don't have to be an expert, I can invest passively. Man, I was just on fire, invested in two deals immediately you know, kept going to webinars and, and, and listening to pitch decks and things like that, because I just wanted to see like, what else is out there? You know, what, what are some value adds that people are doing that I don't know about? And as I was listening to those, I was like, man, this is awesome. Like, I, I feel like this was meant for me because I'm, I'm good with uh, very strategic and analytical. Uh, I'm good with underwriting, coming up with business plans. Uh, not, not great at raising capital, but guess what? I don't have to do everything, right? That, that's what's so, so awesome about the the team aspect of syndication and you know brian like you being in the military you are a team player like you have to be <laughs> or you yeah. you don't get promoted you you no you individuals get... in the military right. yeah exactly right and so i and, and i've always been that way i've always played team sports and and um i notice in in the w2 world the corporate world that's not the case right there, there's people that are, are selfish and not everyone obviously but um, I, I just, for so many reasons, you know, my, going back to my buddy's dad, when I was young, had his own job and um, he, he was not in real estate, but he had his own job and controlled his time. Whereas most adults that, that I knew didn't control their time, right? That their, their job controlled it. And so I think that's when I started figuring out, okay, there's something else out there. And it was a very, very slow progression of, Hey, real estate is this tangible asset I can touch, feel mm-hmm. you know, 90% of, of self-made millionaires uh, make their money through real estate. And yeah. what I love about real estate and, and what we do in, in the multifamily space is you provide shelter, you, you provide housing, a community. It's not just you know a place to shop or a warehouse or whatever. So it's, it's very resilient during uh, downturns in the market, recessions, et cetera. And you really truly have this, you can have an impact on a community and it really brings a sense of fulfillment in my life personally, because I'm able to see, we, we took this, this asset where this, this uh, 18 month old would walk back and forth and she would trip every time she walked over a certain spot because the flooring would, would come up. Mm-hmm. And when we toured the property, her mom was like, thank you so much. This is the spot with, where the flooring is. And we're like, no, 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 we're, we're I, I think we said we were with insurance or with a lend or something, but she thought we were maintenance. Yeah, and w- which was really sad, but it also made me feel really good when we were able to purchase the asset and we, we were able to fix that for her, just that fulfillment yeah. that it brought. Yeah, you know, it's, that reminded me of something. I, I had a two-year-old as a tenant in a property and the carpet, where the carpet and the, uh, the linoleum in the kitchen meet. And yeah, we were in a place that had carpet and linoleum, but uh, you know, <laughs> C-class asset, yeah. there was an exposed tax strip. And we kept on yeah. asking and asking and asking to get that fixed and- you know, it took like four weeks to do it, but uh, with a little kid running around barefoot all the time, stuff like that, that matters. Yeah, definitely. It, oh. And it's little things, right? It, yeah. It's it, it's not like we had to go in there and renovate the whole unit or because they weren't happy. It's little things like that that just make their lives as, as parents and as people easier, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that does definitely help. So, well, so let's, uh, I mean, we, you, you, you talked to, you talked a lot about this, but I'm going to ask you to kind of like condense things down. And we talked a lot about the reasons why, but you know, if you were to put things into one or two sentences, what is your big burning? Why? Oh man, I am very fortunate that I've always been able to spend time with my daughter, just with different, different jobs. I've either worked from home or when I was injured in the military. So my big why is my family, and then uh, secondary is being able to leave a legacy, not just for my family, but for local community. And then I am very passionate about veterans and, and mental health, PTSD, and I personally suffer from that. And so I want to be able to offer, you know, nonprofits or just some community building and gathering uh, places for for veterans to feel more at home. Nice. Nice. I love it. I love it. 
um well i don't love that you have ptsd but uh you know love why you're doing it but um all except for that one little part i love yeah no that's okay i get yeah, it yeah 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 <laughs> so yeah a lot of a lot of people i mean it's not just military but especially military you know right. a lot of people coming out of the military do have you know ptsd at one level or another but yep. uh yep. um Awesome. Well, I mean, you, you also talked about one property, but I'm once again going to ask you to go into a little more detail about, you know, one of the properties you've done and, you know, kind of tell us, tell us how that went for you and your experiences with that. Yeah. So um, one of, uh, and I, I love this property for a mm -hmm. lot of reasons. Number one, it's the only one that I'm local to. I'm only about 30 minutes from it. Uh, number two, it's the only property I'm in that I got the email from the broker underwrote it. And by the way, you you can go on Crixie and LoopNet. That's a really good starting place. But then when you start getting on the broker's list, they'll get you a lot more deals that aren't online. Yeah. And so I was able to get this initial email from the broker, reached out, you know, it's a whisper price and um, underwrote it, went to some other people that were local who knew some other people that were local. All of us were doing syndication and, and local to Nashville in some capacity. And so um, it, when we underwrote it, we uh, we then we're like, hey, this looks great. Uh, numbers numbers look pretty solid. We we're able to tour it together. Um, we were able to go back to the underwriting and, and tweak underwriting when we got a better uh, understanding of uh, of the deferred maintenance, the capex, and any issues that we needed to fix. Um, you know, it, a REIT had owned it, mm -hmm. and they were looking for cash flow, but there was a lot of deferred maintenance. You drove up to to the building, foggy windows everywhere. Uh, there's a tennis court that probably hadn't been used since um, Andre Agassi was a rookie. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that was maybe before my time, but that the, was no, a while ago. I remember, yeah. yeah, he was he was really big in the nine early nineties. Yeah, know? I think uh, no, it, junior high high school for me. So I yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think. Yeah, I think it. it I mean, really, the uh, property was built in the early '80s and 105 units, and uh, I, I really, truly think that that tennis court hadn't been used in 25 years or, or so. But uh, so there are things like that. There's mold and mildew on on all on all of the buildings. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the pool gate was chained up by a, a bike lock had a nice playground and I had a dog park, which was basically just a, a fence. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it wasn't ugly. It's in a B class property in an A class area. It's the yeah. wealthiest County in Tennessee, all the movie stars and athletes, that's where they live. Nice. And so this was a working class for that area, but um, yeah, really, you know, a lot of families lived there. A lot of the kids played in that, you know, rundown tennis court. And, and mm -hmm. so we went in there with a plan and, and this, by the way, this was my first GP mm -hmm. deal. And so I relied on some some experts, uh, some some people that had way more experience than I did, you know, to guide us and, and help us. Uh, there, there's some other new people in that deal as well. But yeah, we knew the area really well. We knew the market extremely well. We knew this was a great, uh, great opportunity. Mm -hmm. I want to say we paid about 200000 a door, which is expensive for a lot yep. of areas. But in this area, it's it's not. And we've been able to go in there. We've added uh, uh, property-wide internet. Uh, we've replaced the uh, the balconies with cedar planks as opposed to just the the old you know uh, iron with with the paint chipping. We've repainted all the exteriors. We've replaced not all of the windows yet, but most of the the foggy windows still have some to do. Really, just got some landscaping. Made it a place. Uh, one of the first things we did, and you know, going back to the REIT owned it, didn't want to invest in in it. There were several broken down cars mm -hmm. in the parking lot, and there was trash not in, well, obviously in the dumpsters, but around yeah. the dumpsters and, you know, furniture and all that. And so, you know, if, if I live there personally and I see trash all over the place, do you think I'd take care of the property or do you think I'd want to live there? Probably no. not. But yeah. now, you know, that was the first thing we did. We pressure washed the exterior, cleaned the property up. And literally within a month of us owning it, mm -hmm. it looked night and day better. And then eventually we did paint the exterior. We probably renovated about 50% of the units we're going to renovate, you know, we, we bought it right before all the, the massive inflation. And so yeah. from one standpoint, nice. that's, that's really benefited us from the rent side, but it's also hurt us because we thought we were going to do about 90 units. And I think yeah. we're only going to be able to do about 60 to 65 units just because the cost of materials yeah. is so much higher. That happens more than a lot of people realize, yeah. you know, and it's, it's not the end of the world. 
you know, it's, it's something that I think a lot of people ask me about, well, what happens if, you know, costs are more, it's, well, if you renovate 70% of the unit, I mean, that's not the end of the world, you know, it's, right. but uh, yeah, yeah, it happens a lot. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and then something else you mentioned, I mean, with just with the general upkeep, I think you hit the nail on the head, you know, it does cost a little bit to keep the the place clean, but the better you take care of it as an owner, the better, better the tenants are going to take care of it. You know, and enforcement is, we, we had a property where for us, the enforcement was kind of a big thing where, you know, we had people that were throwing things, you know, next to the dumpster chairs and mattresses and things like that. And, you know, end of the day, you know, we, we put cameras up and yep. started enforcing, it. you know, the cameras weren't just for that, but they're part of the security things, but a nice part about that, or a good thing that came along with it is when people did that, we were able to pull camera feet up and, Okay. Hey, unit number 22 is that guy walking out. So, but yeah, that's a great point, Brian, because we do all of that, that uh, furniture, the, the oversized mattresses, all the oversized goods outside of the dumpster, yeah. uh, the, the, the trash collectors, they don't pick that up, right? You, no. you have to pay an additional fee. And so at first it, it was more expensive. We did put cameras up there as well. I think that was about $15,000. But the really cool thing about that is now that's actually helped our NOI because yeah. now we don't have people illegally dumping mm-hmm. because we do have the cameras. So yeah, it was a little bit more upfront, yeah. but not only now does the, the property look so much better, people take much better care of the property. And now we're, we're saving a few grand a year because we're yeah. not having the bulk goods come multiple times a week. Yeah. You know, and not only are you saving money, but you know, there, there's also a lot of people like my, my wife is very much like this, you know, 20 years in the military, guess how many times we were searching for apartments or houses to rent, you know, uh, if we showed up to a place that had trash, all, I mean, she wouldn't even stop, you know, it's yeah. just like, Brian, keep driving keep yeah. driving. You know, it's like we have an appointment with the, nope, keep driving, keep driving. Yeah. You know? So, but yeah, you, you end up getting more people. It's, it's a lot easier to, to get people to, <laughs> to sign leases if you have right. a place, but yep. uh, all right. So we're going to transition quickly. Last question for you. And then we'll talk to Frank and that's what's next. Oh man. Lo- lots, <laughs> lots are next. Uh, we're, we're still looking at deals with the higher interest rates, uh, you know, not as much deal flow, We haven't uh, bought a deal in about nine months or so. And, you know, we don't want to just buy just because we want our numbers to go up. We we still want really good returns. Yeah. We have been focusing a lot on marketing and and, um, we have a podcast as well that we've been doing. So really working on on just building the brand, getting our name out there. I think um, we still have pretty lofty goals to acquire properties, but uh, we definitely don't want to force anything. So still looking at at buying and, and still being very opportunistic. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, we are, we're bu- actively buying and, you know, should be closing on one next week and, you know, hopefully, you know, one next month and one in month after, but awesome. uh, yeah, a lot of good stuff, a lot of yeah. good stuff there. All right. So switching gears, Frank, you're up, man. How's it going? It's going good. Appreciate the opportunity, Brian. Absolutely. So I got to ask, how's the weather in Maui today? Uh, it's a little overcast to be honest, but it normally gets a lot hotter, you know, yeah. as you get towards noon. Yeah. yeah. So, so do you like the overcast? Does that give you a nice break from the heat or is, you know, not really, to be honest. Cause like when it's overcast, the ocean, to be honest, doesn't really look that good. Mm-hmm. So, true, um, true, yeah, true. Overcast yeah. Is we got that blue sky reflecting off the ocean. It looks a lot nicer. That is, that is yeah. true. so well, cool, man. So uh, do us a favor. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Frank Tashima, born and raised on Maui. Grew up with a small family, those six of us kids. Wasn't really taught financial literacy. You know, I had aspirations to be a pilot, fireman, but, you know, wasn't really taught a specific direction. Graduated from high school. Went to one semester of college. I didn't like it. So Mm -hmm. I decided to just work. Met my fiance in 2016 and I got introduced to excavation. Her dad owns a a small excavation company. And then after that, I kind of had a goal. I wanted to be a heavy equipment operator, Mm -hmm. but still it was a bit foggy, right? When you think about an operator, you know, they're working till they're 60 and it kind of scared me to be honest. But Mm -hmm. then again, didn't really do much education. So went on, you know, I started studying to be a fireman, started working towards getting into the operators union and then 
my fiance rolls over to me one day and she's like, I want to go to chiropractic school in Dallas beginning in January, 2020. So I was like, okay, I kind of threw everything to the side and we started transitioning um, to Dallas, but I always wanted to move to the States, but I guess never really had a motivation enough to actually get me there yep. until, you know, she said that. So we moved to Dallas December, 2019, but mm -hmm. right before, literally like a week before um, one of my uncles, he, he told me about Rich Dad Poor Dad. It's funny you brought that up, Charlie. He told me you should read it. And I was like, okay. He introduced me to the um, Robert Kiyosaki's game Cash Flow, and we played it with him. And it was kind of eye-opening, but I still didn't know, right? I didn't read the book yet. But mm -hmm. after I moved to Dallas, I was taken out of my comfort zone, and I was put into, you know, I was living by myself. It's literally me and my fiance. We don't know anyone in Dallas. So we were forced to, you know, think outside of the box. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's one of the greatest pivots of my life. Read that book, fell in love, man. It was like a aha moment. Like, you know, there's more, right? So mm -hmm. I read Cash Flow Quadrants. And I just went on a book spree and I just read, yeah. found bigger pockets, you know, like everyone. Mm -hmm. And Brandon Turner was teaching um, how to underwrite deals, right? Single family mm -hmm. flips. Learned about that and went on, you know, I was like, okay, I'm gonna, you know, flip houses. I wanna get into real estate. I'm gonna flip houses. Yeah. Went on and it really didn't make me feel like, I don't know, it didn't make me feel good like I wanted to. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know, I'm gonna go into bigger, small, um, small multifamily. So I started looking at those and even that it was still too small and I didn't know how big I could think, right? So yeah. I, I was like, you know, I'm going to start looking at small apartments. And I thought you had to, you know, have a lot of money. You had to be a big institution. So I set out a goal in 2021 after, you know, I've been reading. I read 11 books in 2021. And in mm -hmm. November 2021, I was like, I'm going to buy me a small apartment, you know, 20 doors max. I think that's yeah. what I can handle. And I reached out to a syndicator that actually lives on Maui. Mm -hmm. And I, I was coming home for Christmas and I I texted him, you know, he, he knows my parents and I was like, hey, can I meet up with you? Um, I'm yeah. coming home for Christmas. So we met up and he introduced me to syndication and it was, you know, I was like, wow, like you, I can actually go bigger than 20 units. So yeah. he, I attended his, um, his three day event and it, that was another pivot point in my life. Syndication is basically an opportunity to bring other mm -hmm. people an investment to them to their forefront where they they normally yeah. don't like no one talks about this especially back home here so that's what got me motivated and you know i've just been yeah. on a uphill battle awesome awesome well you're gonna get to the top of the hill and start coasting is is how it works keep on pushing up the hill because you know eventually uh eventually it flattens out a little bit so well, that said, so talk about, let's talk about your why for a second. Uh, you know, what's, what's your why for doing this? So, you know, there's, I have two whys, right? It's a selfish mm -hmm. why and a selfless why. Didn't really come from much, you know, after I graduated high school, my parents, they took care of us. I'm eternally grateful for what they've done. But after I graduated high school, everything was like, okay, you know, you're kind of on your own and I had no footing right to pursue anything so my selfish why is building a future for my future kids where you know whatever they want to do they can pursue right and you know everyone throws around generational wealth but you know i really want to pursue that and just so everyone that comes after me is able to do what they're passionate about mm -hmm. you know and basically build a future that i wasn't given yeah um and then myself, my selfless why is, you know, giving back to the community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd really love to create, you know, scholarship opportunities for kids going to college, um, yeah. helping out, you know, any, anything in the education, also like revitalization of the land. There's so many things that go on over here. And if I can just at least supply the funds to at least do the projects, then that's my selfless yeah. why. Awesome. Awesome. Well, yeah. let's see if we can help you get uh, a couple steps closer up that hill a little further. But uh, Frank, we got Charlie in the line. What do you want to ask him? Yeah, Charlie, appreciate your time. I do have a question. 
I am the underwriter on our team and I'm looking at deals. How critical does your analysis need to be before going into an LOI, you know, submitting an LOI? Good question. Yeah, great question. Um, and, and before I answer that, Frank, I think you, you mentioned that you have a selfish and a selfless. Why? I think those are both selfless, by the way. I don't think you trying to make genera uh, create generational wealth is, is selfish by any means. <laughs> But yeah, great question about the underwriting. Um, I, I am the underwriter on my team. I love underwriting. I love the analysis side. What I like to do first though, is I don't just underwrite deals for hours automatically. There's a lot of deals. And, and again, I've done this probably hundreds of times. So I'm not saying you're going to get there just because I tell you this, but you probably want to create a couple different phases of underwriting, right? Like there's some quick ways to do it just without going into so much depth that you're spinning your wheels. What I did when I first started underwriting is because I didn't have this massive deal flow. So I got on brokers list on markets. I didn't really care about, um, not like it was a bad market, but I just wanted more practice. And so that gave me a lot more deal flow to start with. Number two, I did actually spend a lot of time underwriting deals, even if I didn't even if I knew that it wasn't going to be something I was going to go after, because I just wanted that practice and practice and practice. Um, as far as to answer your question, Frank, um, I would say that, you know, if you truly are going to go after a deal, you can underwrite for uh, an hour or two and still not feel like you've, you've hit all the points. Yeah. If you're truly going to go after a deal, you need to be hundred percent rock solid that you've done the best that you can with it, in my opinion. And, and the reason being is, let's say that you're like, oh, I, I did a pretty good job. I spent 30 minutes on it. Okay, now I'm going to put an LOI in. Well, are you accounting for the rent growth, uh, the proper rent growth? Or are you just saying, well, his, you know, the last few years, it's been double digits. You want to get as much outside data. Mm -hmm. So that's data, not just that you know, but market comps. You want to tour those comps. So you want to actually be a, um, a fake uh, prospective tenant to go in there. Mm -hmm. You want to know that uh, just because the broker says, hey, check out these five comps, this is what the rent is, is getting there, doesn't mean those are actual comps. I've seen that so many times. Brokers are going to put the best comps there. When you tour a property, one thing that I always ask uh, the, the leasing manager, who do you lose? Uh, what property do you lose tenants to? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they'll give you the actual comps, right? And, and so those might not be on the list, but when you start out, you want to, you want to get into the weeds as much as possible, but then as you feel much more confident, you'll be able to, to get rid of probably 70% of deals within about 10, 15 minutes, just because, you know, you know, that they don't have as much potential. Um, or they don't hit the the underwriting or the uh, investment criteria that you have, you know, kind of told your uh, your investors about. Uh, Brian, I don't know if you have anything to add. You know, I'll I'll take this from a from a different direction. I, I think everything he said. You know, I'm not gonna. I mean, nothing. I'm not gonna contradict anything. But from from a different direction, you know, one thing that I'd like to point out is an LOI is non-binding. Okay, when you go through the processes. You're going to submit an LOI, which is an offer letter. And I mean, the seller's probably going to respond with a counter to whatever you put on that piece of paper. Okay. They're going to ask for a higher price. They're going to ask for more earnest money. All right. But, you know, once again, it's it's going to be a process, but it's, it's non-binding. Even, even if you get that signed, you're going to move to a purchase and sale agreement. Okay. And typically in today's market, you're going to have at least a, you're going to typically have a 30 day contingency in there to be able to back out of the deal. If you find something that, you know, you didn't realize before. So what I'm saying is don't wait until you have all the perfect information to send in the LOI, you know, and this is something, a quote, this is like a old army general, you know, uh, said like the perfect plan executed now is better than a, a good plan executed now is better than the perfect plan two weeks from now, right? So I would say when you get to a point to where you think you're at like the 80% solution, that's where we're putting the LOIs in because, you know, we're doing most of the things Charlie said. We're looking at our comps. You know, we're trying to tour the property before we put the LOI in. We're doing all of that. But 
on the flip side, realize that you don't have to have perfect information everywhere to put the LOI in. You can keep on sharpening the pencil, refining your estimate as you go through. Okay, that's that's great to hear. Just hearing from some people, you know, you should just put it in an LOI and then I hear from other people, you know, you, should, you need to really have your numbers going, but that makes sense, you know. All right, what's next? Um, yeah. Um, so after, you know, you, you're doing all that analysis and whatnot, say after you walk the property to the comps, you, you're coming in at a lower price. What is that gap from whisper to actually your LOI price? Like, mm -hmm. is there a certain gap where you're like, you know, we're not even going to submit an LOI because we're going to end up wasting, you know, the seller brokers? Yeah, great question. I think, uh, well, it definitely depends. It depends on like right today with interest rates being so high is way different than if you asked this question a year and a half ago. I think that it, it also depends on on the broker and your relationship with them. For example, uh, because I had already closed on a few deals, I went in there and I I don't remember, I think they were asking like 11 for it. And we were at, I don't remember, I'm going to say seven and a half million. Mm -hmm. And I, I told the broker, I said, look, I'm not trying to waste anybody's time. I'm not anywhere close to where you guys are. Do you still want me to submit a deal around, let's let's say seven and a half? And he said, you know, if you were new, no, because I think you're wasting time, but you've already closed on some deals. So go ahead and do it. And I, I think, you know, part of the reason he wanted me to do that is to show his seller, Frank, that, hey, we are a little bit too high. And it wasn't just me saying that, um, I, you know, I know they had several other offers that were um, in the eights, uh, mid to high eights. Mm -hmm. And ultimately they ended up selling in the high eights, but uh, you need to make sure that you actually have some type of relationship with the broker too, that they know that you're not just uh, trying to lowball them or that you don't know what you're doing. And I'm not, it's not necessarily, um, a, a number or a percent that I would go and say, Hey, Frank, you know, you have to offer no, you know, 80% or more. That, that's just not the case. And, you know, in, in markets right now where it is harder to sell, they're taking a lot longer to sell. You're finding deals that were under contract that, you know, uh, the, the, the person who won the, the, had the best LOI backed out brokers are coming back. So, I think it's important to submit an LOI, even if the number's not great, but yeah. it's something that you're comfortable with because then the broker does have a you know plan B in case plan A falls apart. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, I don't think there's like a percent or a you know a dollar sign to say it's got to be within this. I think if you're open and honest with the broker, um, and they know that you're not just trying to lowball them or, or you know uh, undercut whatever, then. Yeah. I, I, they'll listen to you at least. Uh, they still might not go with you, but they'll at least listen to you. And, and then next time, um, you know, they'll, they'll again, entertain your offer as opposed to be like, Oh, Frank has no idea what he's doing. You know, I, I think that's a good, I think that's a good approach, you know, talk with the broker, you know, and a lot of times, I mean, brokers know they're, I mean, brokers play, play a game where they're trying to get the highest price but they know about where properties are going to sell. And so if, if the seller just, just, you know, piggybacking on what he said, you know, if, if the broker thinks the seller's too high and they're telling the broker, Hey, I think your price is too high. Sometimes it takes a couple of low offers for that seller to realize, crap, I'm not getting 11. I just got three offers that start with an eight. Oh, I guess, I guess I'm, I guess I'm lower. We're actually in a situation like that right now. Um, conversation with the broker yesterday was, Hey, the seller refused an offer two weeks ago at this price. He, and he told us the price and which brokers don't usually do, but um, we came in, I think 150,000 higher than that price. And we got a counter. And I think it took that first low ball offer. I mean, it wasn't even a low ball. It took that first offer to bring that seller down to where he actually countered our offer. So very close in numbers, but that first offer kind of helped pave the way for our offer to, to get a counter. And um, we just sent in, you know, um, we, we countered his counter today and we're going to see how it goes. But yeah, we were, we were about a million dollars under what the whisper price was um, and more than 10%. So this is, this is a seven figure deal, not a, not eight one. So does that make, I mean, so yeah, I agree hundred percent with what Charlie said, just throwing a little more information. 
and I guess awesome. one other thing I would add too is, you know, and Brian mentioned this earlier, but when you put an offer in, they they will counter, right? They're they're going to counter. So don't come with, hey, we're, we're going to pay. You know, the the most we'll pay is eight five, because mm -hmm. they're going to come back with eight 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 nine whatever it is. Yeah. So put your your first offer in where you know you can come up from there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I just had talked with our acquisitions guy about that the other day. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So it it is nice to have a little bit of room to maneuver um, because, yeah, they're they're likely gonna and, and talk it over with the broker as well. I mean, you don't have to put all your cards in front of the broker, but you know, I I would recommend letting the broker know that you do guys you guys have a little bit of room to negotiate, and this okay. is this is our starting point. All right, we got time for one more question if you got one. Yeah, um, last one, I guess it, it is gonna deal with underwriting a lot. Um, how are you underwriting exit caps? I know um, yeah. the exit, that exit cap is a big lever when you're underwriting. Um, where are you getting that actual existing market cap and how many basis points are you you know, increasing that? Yeah, great question. In, in my my uh, answer is going to be something that is not at all true right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, previous and, and we underwrite for five years typically. So we, you know, the rule of thumb is is ten basis points per year. So we we typically would add uh, fifty basis points to our exit cap. Um, if you look at the cap rates over the last you know eighteen months or so, they've gone up way more in eighteen months than I think most people would have mm -hmm. thought. Um, that being said, though, um, we always look at CoStar data. Um, you know, CoStar is, is they forecast it. Um, doesn't mean it's going to be accurate or, or right, obviously, but we at least start with uh, 50 basis points, but really we, we tend to do probably 75 basis points. So we do about 15 basis points a year. Um, our, our goal is to be more conservative. And if mm -hmm. the numbers don't work, it's easy to, to tweak the, the exit cap rate, but I, I think that's, I personally would never send uh, tweak the, the cap rate just so the numbers look good, um, just so you, you can get a deal. Um, I would much rather, and you hear this all the time, but I would rather uh, you know, promise something to my investors and blow that out of the ballpark than, than opposite, because my goal is to have long-term investors, not one you know, quick win and, and lie to them, uh, so they invest and then they would never invest with me if that makes sense but to answer your question i personally do about 15 basis points a year yeah you know i think one thing that i like and you know i i borrowed this from somebody else a little while ago but um show your investors a range i mean you you have to kind of pick your own number for whatever you're where you're comfortable with um, i would say most people probably use 10 basis points a year but part of there's a little bit of, of of a fudge factor i guess if you are extremely conservative in your market you're never going to buy a property right. right and so part of it is is figuring out where you need to be on returns where you need to be on price and everything else and you know your your underwriting has to be realistic at the same time but what i what i like to do with with investors is show them a range and just say hey look if if the exit cap in five years is exactly the same as the cap rate today, here's what your returns are going to be. You know, if 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 you like the the ten basis point per year, which I think I think most people like the the coaching programs of the world teach, you show them, hey, this is what we're underwriting to, ten basis points a year. Here's what your return is going to look like at ten basis points a year. A, decompression on the cap rate, but I like to show them a range. You know, this is what happens if the cap rate goes up. This is what happens if the cap rate goes down. This is what happens if the cap rate stays the same. And that way investors kind of have an idea of, okay, if, if the market stays where it's at, we're making really good money. If the, if cap rates compress, wow, the, the, the returns are going to be awesome. So that, that's my, my philosophy on it. Um, but that's, that's about where we're at right now. But anyway, we are about out of time. So one last question for each of you, Charlie, you to go first. How can listeners learn more about you? Um, best way to learn more about me and, and my company is our website, hkigllc.com. I'm on LinkedIn and Facebook as well. And then I have a podcast called Passive Investors Playbook that's on all the podcast platforms. 
awesome. And we'll put links to those in the show notes. Frank, same question for you. How can investors learn more about you? Yeah, um, you can visit our website, valleycapital.com. I'm also very active on Instagram. So, yeah. All right, guys. Well, hey, thanks a lot for being on the show today. Very much appreciate your time. And it's a really, really good episode. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Really, really appreciate you having me. Cool. Thanks, Brian and Charlie. Thanks. Hey, if you like that episode, make sure to subscribe. But more importantly, if you haven't joined our multifamily educational community yet, which we call a tribe of titans, you are missing out. Get 30 days free by clicking the link in the description to this episode or go to thetribeoftitans.info and we'll see you there.